Posing Gloves here, and today we're going to be talking about keyboard focus and general sampler tab information that you should know about. So, okay, first keyboard focus. This is ultra important for workflow, and the reason is Renoise will only recognize certain keyboard strokes when you type them in, depending upon where the keyboard focus is. It's common in pretty much every program, but on Renoise, it's been done very deliberately because a lot of times I might be loading up sounds in the browser, but I want my keyboard commands to still affect the pattern editor. It just would make more sense. Like the browser is just less useful to have my keyboard focus over there. But occasionally I may want it over there because I'm going to be doing a series of actions that would be much faster uh, to use keyboard commands specific to the browser. And this is, if I hit control comma, it brings up my preferences, go to the keys, and you see we have global keyboard shortcuts. These are keyboard shortcuts that it does not matter what window you are in, they will always work, versus other keyboard shortcuts such as pattern sequencer shortcuts, which will only work if your pattern sequencer has been highlighted. So you want to be aware of these things. So there are two ways to shift your keyboard focus. First off, how do you know where it's at? You know where it's at by these little corner orange arrows. So right now, that's where it's at. And inside, I have more arrows indicating what track I'm on. So I can move over and change tracks and whatnot. If I want to move it over, I just simply hit Shift Tab. And I will, whoops, Control Tab, my bad. Control Tab. And it will move me around. So you see, oh, I'm moving. There I am. I'm up here now. I'm over here. So whatever keyboard shortcuts are specified to these different areas will be available to me while it's in my keyboard focus. There's a better way most of the time to do this, and that is you simply hold down Alt and you click. So let's say I want it over here. Most of the time I'm shifting between here, here, and here. So I'm switching. I don't often come down into this, uh, the effect rack, uh, but I do come over to the pattern sequencer and the instruments a lot. So if I Alt click, it'll get me there just a touch faster, and I know exactly where it's at instead of scrolling around and maybe missing it. So uh, one, one example of this being useful is let's say that I've now been composing and I'm renaming my stuff now. I've got clear rules. Like this is like now my base. And see, I'm going to hit tab control R because um, I'm on that track and I'll name this one my lead. So you see, no need to touch the mouse, a lot more effective. Tab control R. Now I'll touch this one, uh, chord, whatever it is. Now let's say I want to rename these to reflect the roles they play over here. Well, I could hit shift tab, but I'm just going to hit alt tab. And the reason is if I were to right click and then hit rename, it's just extra menus. I'd rather just put it over there and hit control R and now I can name it base. And then I can hit down control R and I can name it lead down control R and name it chord. Whoops. And you see how much faster that is It's way more intuitive. So that's, uh, that's my spiel about that. So let's go ahead and, um, now let's talk about the general sampler tab. So when you're, when you're working with samples, uh, there's some general things in the background you're going to want to figure out to do. And I'm going to warn you against some things that you probably shouldn't do there. You should use textual commands to fix. And so I'm going to delete these. Bum, bum, bum. And let's go ahead. I need to sneeze, but I'm not sneezing. I'm going to load up some sounds here. So I'm going to load up a sound, hit Alt down, which is a global command because it doesn't it works no matter where my focus is. Load up another one, Alt down. I'll load up another sawtooth. Cool. So I have my uh, my various things loaded up here, but there's a couple, there's a problem right off the bat. This has re been recorded at C1. And as a result, it's far too low for me to be able to play. Like that's just really low. And I'm hitting notes that are pretty high. If we go in here, you can see it's like C4. It should not be that low. So this is the sampler tab. And I, I got to it by hitting sampler. But another way to get to it, the way I use more often is F3. So F3 bang, I am now on the sampler tab. You can see the picture of the waveform here. And we're gonna cover slicing in another video. So I'm not gonna talk about slicing up your sample or how to interact between slicing and the pattern editor quite yet, because that's like, those are like whole separate topics. And there are good videos on those, um, on the Renoise uh, official channel. So that, that like pretty much just show how to do the stuff. They just don't show you how to do it in the context of a song. So, Let's go ahead, let's jump over to the sample properties. Now, my problem is it's too low, so I'm gonna transpose it up. This is music theory, there are 12 notes in an octave. I want it to go up three octaves, so 12 times three is 36. And now my notes are a lot more reasonable for the range I'm playing them in. So I can play now, I can now legitimately play 
bass notes and have them actually be bassy and I can play lead notes and have them be my lead. Now, if we listen to that, it's a little painful, but you hear is that, ah, and you're like, that does not sound correct. That's because we have aliasing. So the way we can fix this, this is all covered in my digital audio basic series, if you don't know what aliasing is. But to fix this, I'm gonna go down here and we have interpolation. I'm gonna go click on this AA, this just activates it. And there's different settings. So we can have none, so it'll sound the same. You just hear all that extra buzzing that shouldn't be there. Well, I can turn on, and now I'm gonna go to linear. I believe this uses two points or one point. And it's not really all that much better. If we go to cubic, I believe this is uh, four points, three points. Cube generally means three, so I'm gonna guess three. If you hover over it, it will actually tell you, I believe. Uh, cubic, oh no, it's four. It is four, interpolates between four sample points. And then finally we have sync. And this one is the most, it takes up the most processing, but check it out. Versus, uh, if we had it off, that's what it originally sounded like. So this is way better. It is quite a bit more processing intensive, but here we, our waveform is so um, small and we're not really doing anything crazy. So it doesn't really have much of an impact right now. But later on, you may consider uh, turning this off. For plugins, this doesn't really matter. It's a This is a sampler property thing. So we have the ability to do this. We can also sync things up. So when we get into drum, drum sounds, um, it's very easy to sync drum sounds up. So you get the idea. So we come in here and we have the ability to interpolate. So that will decrease all that extra aliasing going on, that extra low frequency buzzing. When we play very high notes, it comes out when you play high notes. And then we also have transposition. This is also why distortion plugins usually provide oversampling because when you distort something, you will, you will hit the frequency limit and you don't want things coming back into your spectrum. You know, sometimes you do if you're going for that lo-fi sound. Okay, so a couple of the cool things about the, the sample properties that I like to use is one of them is you can draw waveforms. So if you hit draw, um, nothing happens yet. You have to click and you can say how many samples you want to draw. And then this stuff you can pretty much leave alone. And so we'll hit process and it comes out as a line and now we can draw in waveforms. So we say, oh, we'll draw our own sine wave and we'll be so cool. Now, it's like, wow. And then a lot of times if you want like a bass type sound, this is pretty good. Maybe do something like this. And bring it down. Maybe go up. So you see, it's like, wow, you, yeah, I have a lot of control. This is sort of an art form. I've spent so much time drawing things just to see what they would sound like. You'd be surprised because a, a curve and a waveform represents a whole lot more going on than just a curve. It's like a whole harmonic series is being implied every time you draw a line. So it's like kind of crazy to wrap your head around. But anyways, that's what drawing does. Uh, there's also one where you can generate waveforms. That's a tool available on the Renoise forms if you want that. So there's something I wanted to warn you about, and uh, I don't use it all that often anymore because there's way better ways, but you can change an instrument to be mono. So right now I can play two notes at the same time. Whoops. There you go, that's a better example. And you see I'm clipping right now, so that's not good. But I could change it so that it's only mono, so that even if I hit two notes at the same time, you see it has to pick one. It doesn't even show it down here because it won't let me. So. And then you could set a glide time. And so you could set, now this is done using the glide command. This is why I don't recommend using this method. Because you can do more specific glides. So you could just treat it as a mono instrument and you could come into your thing and write it out. So let's just say, uh, what I'm basically saying is if we come in here, this, uh, if we use mono, we're limited to one glide time and we pretty much have to settle with that. Um, you can, you can augment it using commands here, but it gets more complicated. I think it's better just to write in your glides. The only time I'd use this is if, is if you're cool with a static glide time. If you're cool with that, then cool, go with that. But if you're not cool with that, then write it out here. More often than not, you'll get more expressive leads by writing in commands through the effect command line here. We haven't talked about those yet, um, because they, they just take a little bit to explain. So we're not going to talk about them. I'm just saying for now, just as a brand new, brand new at this, easy way to get mono, but just be careful. And it does count in hexadecimal, which is why you have weird numbers. The G stands for glide. 
the other letters are actually numbers. So that's what the whole, so just be careful about this one. Um, and that's, that's pretty much all I want to show you for general, general sample manipulation. When you come into the sampler tab, you have the ability to open up special effect chains. And so let's say this one had some high end buzz I didn't like. I could EQ it here. And now, uh, so now it sounds like this, right? And so I just typed in an EQ and it just popped up and away I EQ'd it, oh, there we go. Uh, that's really useful because over here, now no matter what track I pull it on, it will go through that track processing and it will also receive the equalization prior to it going through. So I've, ex I've affected it on the sample level. The modulation tab, let's say we wanna make like a bell type sound. Well, this is like a whole discussion on its own. I'm not really gonna cover it in this series cause it's just a beginner series on just general making songs. But one thing you could use is you could use an envelope, a volume envelope. This is basically instructions that tells the volume how to behave over time. I want it to turn all the way on immediately. I want it to not sustain, meaning when I hold down my key, it goes, it doesn't matter. It'll, it'll decay to zero. So I basically said when I hit a key, go down to zero and my, according to my decay time, which is two seconds, which is a long time. That's, too, that's too long. But I also have a release. So you see how I jumped over here? That's because my release is one second. So it's gonna, when I let go of my key, it's gonna jump to the release stage. So if I bring my decay time up, I, now I take my um, octave up. That's pretty cool. And then I could type in, say, hey, let's add an effect chain. And I want to affect it on the track level. I don't want this to be specific to my sample. So let's say I'll name this um, my bell. And I will go ahead and put a reverb on it. So I'll type in reverb. I'll use the MP reverb. I'm not going to touch anything here. And now I'll put it down a little line. Let's just go with that. It's very loud. Let's take that down. So here we go. And then away you go. And we'll look at more about putting notes in here and stuff because we could get fancier. We could add delays to achieve particular drum rhythms. Um, but that's that. So that's uh, the sampler tab in a nutshell. I didn't cover key zones. You won't touch these very often until we get into more advanced instruments, which we're not going to touch because you don't need them for a while. Like if This is sort of like extra. You're now getting into more advanced territory. And then also uh, phrases. I didn't talk about phrases. Another thing we're not really just going to touch. I prefer to write stuff out, but phrases have a unique role in the ability to create um, sequences very quickly. And so especially in a live performance it can be extraordinarily useful. Uh, you could use them to generate arpeggiations and things without having to waste your time on like a whole load of work. But you see, it looks just like our um, our sample, our pattern editor window, but now it's a sample editor window uh, and it, it's, it's specific to our sample. So really cool. Again, we're not going to touch this really or this, but that those are just some settings you should know about. Just a brief warning about the whole mono thing because... Um, yeah, because you'll see, you, you just have more options, and then you can pick which one suits your song the best. And then you also see we can augment things. Like, let's say, let's make it even weird. Let's add um, a envelope to control the pitch. Yeah, let's do that. So let's uh, add one of those. And check this out. It's weird. That's beautiful, right? But uh, this is now augmenting our pitch, and we have a separate one for our volume, as you can see, which is a totally different envelope. And so we did just loads of power back here. My challenge to you is to go ahead, load up some sounds, mess with some envelopes back here, get it, get the sound to act the way you want. Um, if it's too low, bring it up. Just go ahead, load up some, just get used to this sort of workflow. And then even go ahead and try and sequence something really simple. And we'll talk about sequencing here, um, and probably not the next video, because I want to talk about slicing drums, and then we'll jump into sequencing, I believe. If you have any questions, let me know, subscribe, and have a blessed day. The most enlightened of all the political men in our time. We should strive to do things in his spirit. 
not to use violence in fighting for our cause, but by non-participation in anything you believe is evil.